Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for tuning in wherever you are in the world and, and whatever time you're listening in, I uh, welcome. I really appreciate you checking in. And at the same time, I really hope that you and your families are safe during these challenging times. Uh, my name is Imre Varyu, and I'm a medical scientist and a health communication specialist. And for over eight years, I've been doing some very exciting research at the intersection of inflammation and coagulation more specifically focusing on the role of extracellular traps, more specific, even more specifically on the neutrophil extracellular traps and how they affect the formation and, and the dissolution of blood clots. And today I'm very excited to share some of the basic principles and some of the basic learnings that I've accumulated throughout these years. And, and this is gonna be an introductory lecture about um, neutrophil extracellular traps and some of the exciting pathways that that they that they cross and some of the exciting uh, pathologies and and even physiologies that they bring about in the human body. So I hope you'll enjoy this journey as much as I do. And without further ado, let's see what we're going to discuss today. So I will, as much as I would love to say that you should stop me at any point if you have questions, and we can't do that this time. So feel free to send me an email. And I'll be very happy to continue the discussion at any point. So the first thing that we're going to look through is a little bit talking about the formation of extracellular traps, a little bit defining what they are, how, how they are formed, what forms do they have, what different types do they have, and also uh, a little bit about their structure and what they're composed of. Then we're going to move on to describing the physiological and the pathological roles of these extracellular traps. It's a huge task, and it's impossible uh, within the limits of this time, but uh, we'll dig into some interesting uh, physiological and pathological aspects. And, the, and in the third um, part, we're going to segue into discussing the possible and or already shown role of the extracellular traps and, and some of the implications of COVID-19 and, and infections and infection complications and, and more general. So that's what's ahead of us. And let's start with the first point. Let's talk a little bit about extracellular traps themselves. In order to do that, let's just take a step back here and, and imagine this cell that everyone admires. It's called the polymorphonuclear cell or neutrophil. And the neutrophil is a round shaped um, cell that is, that is found in the circulation and many other, many other organs. It has this very specific um, nuclear structure, as you can see here on the left. It's this trifold, dumbbell-shaped, very condensed, uh, chromatin-packed uh, structure that is in the middle. It has a bunch of granules, a bunch of mitochondria, and of course, a lot of cellular uh, organelles inside. And I really want to focus on these two components, the nucleus here and, and, the, and the lots and lots of granules that contain all the good enzymes and all the good antimicrobial proteins that, that the neutrophil has to offer. And we've known for, for quite a long time that if we start stimulating the neutrophil with various bacterial, viral, fungal, or, or even cytokinal um, stimuli, neutrophils will react in, 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 in a limited number of ways. The one thing they can do is they can go through phagocytosis, right? Exocellular bacteria and fungi can be captured through phagocytosis. This means that, that the neutrophil will engulf uh, the pathogen and will digest it with inside, inside its own uh, cellular structure. We've known, them for, we've known that for quite a long time. We also know that the other pathway, classic, and a classic, classic pathway that uh, neutrophils can take is degranulation, is the release of their enzymes into the extracellular space and killing the microbes uh, in, the, in the surrounding area. And what is really exciting here is that we've known the, about these mechanisms for quite some, quite some time now, and the, the actual first microscopic investigations on neutrophils by Metchnikoff and Ehrlich, they were carried out in the, as, as, as early as the 19th century. And for over 100 years, we weren't able to discover a third way in which neutrophils are able to kill pathogens and, or destabilize uh, de pathogens. And that is through the formation of neutrophil exocellular traps. And neutrophil exocellular traps are a very exciting structure. It means that during the formation of, uh, um, of these structures, 
the nuclear structure of the polymorphic nuclear cell, cells decondenses. It mixes with some of the granular enzymes, and then this whole DNA histone granular enzyme mix gets catapulted into the extracellular space. They're capturing and immobilizing bacteria. And this was hiding in plain sight for over 100 years until Arthur Zichlinski and his lab in 2004 discovered that, that, that they exist. So this is just a, a, a beautiful um, scanning electron microscopic image here from one of our publications. And um, really, when you get to get the joy of working with these structures, it, the first thing you realize about neutrophil cellular traps is that they are really beautiful. You can you can see in the in the scanning electron microscopic image here on the left uh, this this kind of threaded structure that has like 15, 25 nanometers di nanometers in diameter. Uh, it's it's decorated with these granular proteins, uh, histones, presumably uh, elastase, and a bunch of other granular proteins. And you can see how they engulf not not only pathogens but also cellular structures within the body. Very, uh, very beautiful uh, structures. And if you if you do an immunohistochemistry, you can see with blue the DNA web that is the, the backbone of the neutrophil cell traps. And you can see the red dotted structures that are histones attached to this uh, beautiful matrix. Uh, besides being beautiful, they come in many flavors. So there's not only one type of neutrophil cell traps. Uh, soon after 2004, it has been. It, 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 it started to, to become clearer and clearer that there are multiple pathways that lead to netosis, which is the, the cellular death-like pathway that leads to the formation of neutrophil cell traps or nets. So this netosis has at least three different types, but probably way more than that. The three major types are depicted on this image. So if we first look in the, at the middle arrow, uh, we will see that if we stimulate the, the neutrophil with uh, certain agents and certain triggers, such as PMA, formal acetate, and we wait three to four hours in vitro, which is pretty, pretty long. And what's going to happen is that the nucleus decondenses, the, granule, the granular proteins start mixing uh, with, the, with the nucleus, and then this swollen mix is getting exposed, the membrane ruptures, and the exocell and, and now the DNA granular mix is now an extracellular trap outside the cell. This is a true cell death. If we look a little bit higher than that, the first line, the first arrow, um, if we follow that, we see an alternate version of net formation. This version does not lead to a cell death immediately. This leads to an anucleotic cytoplast formation. So in this case, to, when we trigger uh, netosis with certain microbes, such as staphylococcus, it has been shown that netosis goes about in small chunks instead of in, in one big burst. And these small chunks being released from time to time still um, allow the neutrophil to stay alive and to stay functional even without losing the full nuclear structure. So it's a very exciting uh, type of uh, netosis. This one is called the vital netosis, uh, vital netosis, while the previous version is called the suicidal netosis, which leads to cell death. And the third one down here at the bottom is, um, is a very particular one, is when net release is mediated by mitochondrial DNA. So these are mitochondrial nets, which are much rarer, but uh, when we simulate eosinophils, for instance, um, we, can, we can actually detect them. And if we take, uh, take a step back, we also recognize that, that neutrophil exocellular traps are not the only exocellular traps out there. Neutrophils are not the only cells that will go about this very specific release of, of DNA into the exocellular space. So while well, in the first image, it's a beautiful uh, neutrophil exocellular trap from the Wagner lab. Um, in the next uh, image, you will see down here, if we stimulate macrophages with candida albicans, we can see under certain circumstances similar exocellular trap formation. This time, it's a macrophage exocellular trap or MET formation. Another form of ETs or exocellular traps is when we stimulate mast cells. In mast cells, it's, 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 already, it's, it's also been shown. And in this blood paper, Kirkwood's book by the end, and colleagues have shown that mast cells also undergo exocellular trap formation under certain circumstances, as you can see in the uh, triptase staining. 
Uh, we can also simulate the eosinophils in a way that they will release their um, their excess their DNA. And as I mentioned a couple of times, uh, mitochondrial netosis was detected in eosinophils. But what's even more interesting is that it's not only human cells and it's not only animal cells that can extrude their DNA. Down here at the bottom, you will see uh, a paper and, a, and an image from a paper from Plant Physiology from 2009. That, and the, the authors actually showed that at the very tip of the plant roots, there is some extracellular trap formation that is, that is meant to defend the plant root from infection. If we, if we give some DNAs in the mix and we start uh, enzymatically cutting off the extracellular, tra the extracellular traps that surround the very tip of the root, we will see that infections will have a much, more, much higher propensity of entering, uh, entering the plants. It's a very interesting mechanism that seems to be conserved around all eukaryotic uh, cells, or at least certain eukaryotic cell, cell types. And of course, I just wanted to acknowledge the fact that once someone starts talking about ETs, the first thing that comes to mind is the original ET. So I just wanted to give a nod to that. It's a really hard task to, uh, to get all the DNA out from the cell. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that because it's a really exciting part of, of the um, net formation story. But let's take a, let's focus on neutrophils here. So if we if we take a look at the nuclear structure of the of the neutrophil, we will see that it's a very compact, very wound wound up DNA. Um, if you take a look at the middle of this image, um, a little bit towards the bottom, you will see the coiled structure, uh, how DNA is kind of spun around uh, histones and how histones are holding this very tight structure together. So the task here. In order to loosen this interaction up is to loosen the interaction between histones or the holding proteins and DNA. Now, this is a very, this is a very simple charge-based uh, interaction, so to say. Histones are generally positively charged under intracellular pH, and, uh, and at the same time, DNA are a negative, DNA strands are negatively charged. So this is a really, really um, tough, a uh, really strong um, connection between the two. So how can we loosen this interaction and how can the cell do that? There are multiple ways. If you look right above um, the, the histones, you will see something that, that in red uh, that is called PAD4. That's peptidyl arginyl deaminase. That, is, that was thought to be the hallmark of netosis, the hallmark enzyme of netosis for, for long years. What this enzyme does is that it converts peptidyl arginine into peptidyl citril, and it cleaves in a free, a free ammonia of this peptidyl arginyl chain, thereby reducing the positive charge of histones. Now, when we reduce that, the interaction loosens up. And as you can see upstream of that, um, this requires, um, in many instances, ROS formation, reactive oxygen species formation, which is, uh, which is thought to be brought about uh, by an, an NADPH oxidase upstream in the signaling pathway that, that leads to this uh, loosening interaction. So that's one significant way of loosening the interaction. However, it, it really became clear after a time that PAD4 cannot be the only one to do this. And if you, look, if, you, if you look a little bit to the right in green, you will see MPO, myeloperoxidase, which is again a hallmark of netosis, a very important enzyme that gets activated uh, during the process of netosis. And it's able to chlorinate uh, histones and thereby also hiding some of their positive charges uh, from plain sight. And, and that's, uh, that's another way of loosening this interaction. The third way is if you look to the bottom, you will see that there's, there's a possibility to cleave histones proteolytically. And this proteolytic cleavage is brought about by multiple enzymes, but most importantly, um, it seems to be that neutrophil allostase is the key player in this mechanism. Neutrophil allostase, which, which is originally in the granules, it's a very exciting enzyme, um, originally in the granules, and during degranulation, it escapes the cell. But during net formation, it travels to the nucleus and starts processing some of the histones um, in order to help loosen this interaction. So there are multiple ways to loosen this interaction. There are multiple ways to, um, to get there um, and, and start thinking about catapulting DNA. Um, but 
that's uh, this this um these multiple ways can also be summarized in a different way now i know that the worst thing that a presenter can do is to put a table like this in in the presentation so i'm really not going to spend much time on it what i wanted to highlight here is that today it's clear that different triggers um, go through different pathways that lead to different that lead to different types of, of of loosening of this interaction. If we look at the very top line, you will we will see that PMA, which is a, a very very um, widely used um, in vitro trigger for natosis, at least used to be, does not require path four uh, in its pathway, in its natosis pathway. Well, as eonamycin does not require any oxidase right below that right and if we go through the different triggers we see that these different um, and natosis pathways are requiring different components so now that we talked a little bit about the formation about the different forms of natosis uh, let's let's take a look at what these structures actually meant to do and it's a harder question than it seems in 2004 when they were discovered everyone thought that that the mere function of the neutrophil exocellular traps is literally to trap bacteria and trap exocellular pathogens. And they seem to be designed to do that. Nets are really sticky if you work with them in, in the laboratory. It's like it's really like these sticky spider webs that stick to everything. So it, it was really not a surprise to see bacteria here. Uh, here probably it's Shigele um, being trapped um, on the left from the originals. Zelensky paper. Uh, soon it became apparent that, uh, that it can also entrap viral agents such as HIV as this clever um, uh, page from Cell shows. And if we take a, if we take a closer look at, at what, what really is inside these nets and, and what the constituents are, it's really not surprising that, that, they're, that they're doing so well under laboratory uh, circumstances in, uh, in capturing and sometimes even killing bacteria. It's full of histones, right? And histones in the uh, we we think about the histones as these um, these holder structures for DNA. But once they're externalized, once they're in the ex extracellular space, histones become uh, become a real weapon for uh, for innate immunity. Histones released in the circulation and histones released in the tissues. If they meet bacteria, fun fungi and other pathogens, what they supposedly do is they form pores uh, in those membrane structures, and they're very efficient killers, uh, killer pathogen killers. Of course, they're a double-edged sword. Uh, they're not 100% specific to uh, bacteria and pathogens, so in the next uh, instances, we'll, we'll see some of the detrimental effects of that, but histones are very potent in, uh, in killing bacteria and other pathogens. We also have a bunch of allostase and other, and other serine proteases, and also cathepsin, um, as, as another protease um, embedded in nets, which are, again, very efficient in cleaving certain bacterial proteins. We also have myeloperoxidase, which is able to chlorinate and, and, and inactivate certain bacterial components. And we have the actual defensins, LL37, and other antimicrobial proteins that also play a role. So it, it seems that nets are really well suited to, uh, to capture pathogens. There's an ongoing debate whether they, all, they, they, whether they actually kill pathogens as well. It seems in certain instances, they're able to do that. In certain instances, they're only able to immobilize pathogens. And there are some rare instances where, uh, where something different happens when certain pathogens are able to kind of live within nets and, and, and form some sort of biofilm-ish um, structure or, or um, a community uh, within nets. But that, that seems to be the, the rare case. So that's what we think. Um, this is the originally thought nets, uh, nets did. But as we alluded to that already, they can be really detrimental to the host. And it soon became clear that nets are a pathogenetic component of a host of known diseases. It doesn't necessarily uh, make them the cause of these diseases. But if we look at a range of diseases, from autoimmune diseases to lung disease to cancer, uh, nets have been detected since 2004. And this is really just a high-level summary of all those uh, pathological conditions that NATs participate in. On the, on the very left, you will see that um, it, it's mainly mediated by histones, but uh, NATs are not only detrimental to bacterial cells, as we already mentioned. They are also detrimental to certain tissue cells. If, they're, if they get out of control within the tissue, they can cause tissue damage, uh, a delay in tissue repair. This is especially important in, in, in healing diabetic wounds, where the Wagner lab already showed that.
And if NETs are present, which are more likely to be present in diabetic patients because hypoglycemia makes neutrophils more, uh, more susceptible to NET formation, then the presence of NETs actually inhibits wound healing as well in certain circumstances. Um, they, they, can, they have all already been shown in, in the pathogenesis of sepsis, uh, and, and autoimmunity, a host of autoimmune diseases. The very first candidate and, and the very actively researched um, pathogenetic kind of component of, kind of disease was, was SLE, systemic lipocytosis. Uh, for years, we, we, we really had no idea why uh, anti DNA and anti double stranded DNA antibodies would form and, and in what way would they form inside and we know we, we detect that in patients and we know it's it's one of the one of the pathological findings in the disease but we have had really no idea what what the uh, what the substrate for the formation of those antibodies uh, was and when nets were discovered sure these actively exposed uh, DNA strands uh, on, on histones, then, then suddenly uh, this became to be in, in the center of, of atten center of attention because uh, they seem to be an explanation for how the immune cells could, could actually sense and start forming antibodies against a double-stranded DNA. So that, 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 is, uh, that is also something that has been actively researched. If we, if we take a step to the right, you can see that if, if NATS interact with macrophages, uh, it, uh, they, uh, macrophages are activated to secrete interleukin-1 beta, and that leads to a range of chronic inflammations, such as atherosclerosis. It can propose uh, atherosclerosis, tumor-associated inflammation, and, and certain organ, organ damages in, in cancer and ischemia or perfusion injury. Then in the third step, we can take a look in the middle, where we'll see what happens if nets get released to the, uh, to the circulation. Now, anyone who has worked with blood and serum um, knows that, that uh, can imagine that if such a sticky, such a highly charged um, web-like structure gets in the circulation, that can't really go well. And that's what really happens. Nets, if they appear in the circulation, they lead to vessel occlusion very quickly. They hyperstimulate coagulation. They inhibit the dissolution of clots. And they can really, really quickly uh, lead to, to severe thrombosis. And now, actually, today, we think that, and that nets are present in both arterial and venous thrombosis, uh, and also in certain forms of capillary thrombosis. We're going to talk about this a little bit um, in more detail in the upcoming slides. On the right, you can see that net, net formation has been detected in certain tumor um, uh, progressions uh, in, in tumor beds and also um, enabling tumor cells to, to stick to, um, to a certain tissue and, and to proliferate. And therefore, um, they have been a candidate, in, in a candidate player in metastasis formation. We can see how nets can trigger into, uh, and, uh, autoantibody formation and also how they interplay with the, with the um, complement system to, to work together towards in the formation of gout. So these are just really, um, this is really just a cherry-picked selection of, of, of uh, diseases and pathological conditions in which nets play a role. Uh, let's just zoom in in the middle here. Now let's, let's talk a, a little bit about this very exciting interaction of net formation and blood clot formation. Now today we know that this is a two-way interaction. If we take a look at the left and take a look at the bottom, uh, this image depicts an injured endothel endothelium and in, in, let's say in a, in, a, in a capillary system. When this injury happens, neutrophils, well, neutrophils will, be, uh, will be drawn to that uh, to that part of, of the endothelium. And neutrophils can actually go through an activation through this endothelial damage that will cause this, this octopus-like structure to appear, which is, now, which, is, which is how nets are depicted on this image. Once nets appear in the circulation, multiple things go, go hayward. So one thing we know is that DNA, which is the backbone of, of, of nets, is a very, very potent um, trigger for, for coagulation. Or the, uh, namely for the uh, intrinsic pathway of, of coagulation. Histones themselves are able, if we look in the middle and the top, we'll see that histones are able to activate platelets through toll-like receptors. Activated platelets, uh, they will stick to von Willebrand factor released from the, uh, from the injured endothelium, and platelets 
platelets will also provide surface for the coagulation factors to build together. Once that process gets going, the polyphosphate also gets secreted from platelets, which further triggers the intrinsic pathway of coagulation. And as the coagulation factors build up, it all ends up in a fibrin formation, which you can see on the right side, um, this half-staggered um, dumbbell-shaped structure um, formation. And, and fibrin is really what holds, fi uh, what holds blood clots together. So once fibrin appears in the circulation, fibrin starts capturing cells, further platelets, further cell, further red blood cells. And this meshwork, this combined meshwork of nets, bombilibrin factor, and also fibrin, this trifecta is what they, we think is really, really, really thrombosis. We used to focus, uh, we used to focus on fibrin. And for, for really, really long years, uh, we thought of fibrin as the primary scaffold of trombi. But now we know that there are at least two other scaffolds in, in trombi that hold trombi and, and other block clots together. And, and these are from liberin factor released from the damage in the thelium and neutrophil exosol traps released from neutrophils. So if we take a look at uh, just once again, beautiful image of neutrophil exosol traps, this fine threaded structure, and uh, we compare it with, with fibrin, with fibrin and what fibrin looks like in vitro, we can see some similarities. Fibrin is generally thicker, so to say, on average. Um, it's, um, it's, it's more like in the, uh, up in the, in the 100 nanometer uh, region or so say 50 to 150 nanometer in diameter, uh, whereas, um, whereas nets are, th are way thinner. Nets are always decorated with proteins. Fibrin in vitro is just pure, pure strands, but it's really the, the, the combined meshwork of these two components that, that brings us to clot formation. And one thing to mention here is that pathogens already know this. And we and we and we and we have to remind ourselves that that, that pathogens already know this. Pathogens are equipped to not only cleave fibrin, which is the primary scaffold in, in trombi, but also to cleave nets. And if we think back to the example, to the very ancient example of what uh, what what's, what streptococci do, streptococci release streptokinase which is an activator of the uh, of the plasminogen plasmin system, which will eventually cleave fibrin and, and lead to clot dissolution. And at the same time, streptodornase is synthesized in the same streptococci, and streptodornase is a DNase. So why would someone have a DNase uh, right next to the right next to uh, an enzyme that that is able to eventually lead to the cleavage of fibrin? Well, the reason, probably, as we think today, is that these two processes, netosis and thrombosis, they are together. They, they work together when, when capturing bacteria in the circulation. So this image really depicts that, that, that notion of immunothrombosis, where a pathogen comes in the system, the pathogen activates neutrophil exosolar trap formation, and as soon as neutrophil exosolar traps are in the circulation, they start triggering fibrin formation. So we know that some of the pathogens or have already tried to, to come uh, to, to overcome this double barrier, right? With with the combined synthesis uh, of, of fibrin cleavage and, and DNA cleavage enzymes, and it's so true that for years, when streptokinase was identified as as a, as a potential medication, and it was really hard to purify it and really hard to clean all the streptodornase off of it. And years later, we think back and we say maybe we shouldn't have. Maybe we should have kept those things together because pathogens knew better what was inside a thrombus than, than we knew at that time. So interesting to think about that, in that from that perspective. And this really segues into our, our last, last topic of discussion here, which is, which is how and, and what role, if any, uh, neutrophil exosol traps or exosol traps um, themselves play in, in COVID-19. And here, a lot of the data um, comes from preliminary studies, preliminary observations. There's, there's a bunch of uh, preprint material online. It's really hard at this point to say something, but what we can definitely think of is all the different pathways that NATS can, uh, can possibly influence. We know from previous infections and we know from pre previous path uh, pathogenetic kind of pathways 
that net formation can contribute to a, a ARDS, which is an acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a very severe, it leads to very severe lung damage and, and respiratory dysfunction. And we know that in, in influenza, for instance, when ARDS happens, nets are there in the pathogenesis. So that's, a, that's definitely a candidate pathway. Uh, if, you look at, uh, if you look at the top uh, circle here, you can also see mucus formation and mucus accumulation. The reason it's there is that because we know that in cystic fibrosis patients who have this chronic condition, a genetically inherited condition that leads to mucus accumulation, dead neutrophils and, and natotic neutrophils are also there in the that mucus. And we know that that, strep, that, that DNAs, is, um, inhaling DNAs is helps, uh, helps the quality of life for these patients. So, uh, so we're also focusing on that when we talk about COVID-19. It's, it's, it's a candidate that, 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 that might, that's might be my pillar role in mucus formation. On the, on the left, we can see atherosclerosis, which is more, more like a long-term complication uh, that, that COVID-19 COVID through natosis might lead to. And down here um, at, the, at the very bottom, uh, we will see thrombosis, which we already talked about how nets might contribute to thrombosis. It's an especially, uh, especially exciting part of uh, COVID-19 um, pathogenesis because we do know that there is microthrombus formation in, in, in the vessels of uh, in, in certain pulmonary vessels. Um, you will see and you will appreciate in this publication from, from Lepkes and and colleagues from this subset of, of, of Lancet that they identified that in COVID-19 lungs, they actually, these lungs are actually filled with capillaries that are filled with thrombi that contain nets. Um, and this is especially in severe COVID-19. Down here in the, in the second panel at the bottom, you will see that DNA is stained with red, while citrullinated histones are, are stained with green. You can see that these thrombi are really rich in citrullinated histones, which are, which are a hallmark of that formation. So we know that there is some natotic activity and in, in, in the vascular com uh, complications of, in these patients. And just a trigger warning: so the, the next image is, is going to be um, uh, is going to be about a patient who actually goes through a thrombosis, not in the lungs but in the periphery. So um, just look away for a second if um, that's that, that's too much. But this is the site that some of uh, some of the um, yeah, intensive uh, intensive care unit doctors see. Uh, this can this can COVID can can cause in 16 percent of the cases actually, according to a study, it can cause a complications not only in the lungs but also in the per system. So uh, it's really something to think about and really to to watch closely. Okay, image is gone, so now you can look again. Uh, and and uh, just uh, just as a comparison, the 16% might sound you know might sound a lot or might sound you know just just a little, but with influence, the thrombotic complications uh, uh, are around 4.3, 4.6%. So it's it's definitely a higher propensity uh, for uh, thrombotic complications in COVID-19 patients. And of course, of course that 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 puts nets in um, in a highly suspicious position. There's already a proposed mechanism of how thrombosis in microcapillaries and 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 other vasculature can form. If you take a look at the left side here, this is just really a proposed mechanism of how. Uh, COVID-19, uh, how SARS-CoV-2 can attach to epithelial sur surfaces through the ACE2 receptors that will get internalized, and then that will lead to tissue damage and damps. Uh, and these damps will, uh, these associated molecular patterns, well, damage associated molecular patterns will lead to a triggering, to triggering natosis, and this triggered natosis will lead to further organ damage. And, and if this epithelial surface happens to be like within the vasculature, then this will lead to, to thrombosis. Again, this is, this is just a model as of yet, but what we do know from measurements from, from COVID sera actually, is that COVID patients do seem to have elevated levels of net markers. What are some of the net markers? First, you will see CFDNA, which is cell-free DNA. Uh, which really means that that these patients have a, have a lot of DNA, uh, much higher concentration of DNA in, uh, in their in their sera than than healthy uh, individuals do. However, CFDNA, healthy DNA, is not really specific to natosis. It can come from necrosis and a, a bunch of other conditions. What is more specific is citrullinated H3, which is citrullinated histone type three, uh, which which shows that there was some pad activity uh, somewhere. And that, that led to the formation of that citrullinated histone. 
And at the, at the same time, MPO DNA complexes, myeloperoxidase DNA complexes were also detected, which we already talked about how important that MPO is in, in the process. So that these two markers are more specific to netosis, and these were elevated in, um, in, a, in a small study on, on our 50-something patients. Uh, but it's a very important finding. And what was, was also um, uh, interesting in, this, in the same study is that uh, the COVID-19 patient sera themselves induced netosis in, uh, in vitro, under in vitro conditions. So they're definitely there. They're definitely there in the vascular compl complications, but we'll, we'll continue to, uh, to be on the lookout in terms of, of, of where NATS can play, might play more of a role in, in COVID-19 complications. So with all that said, what we achieved today in this short time is we discussed various ways of net formation, right? We talked about suicidal netosis. We talked about mitochondrial netosis. Uh, we, we also talked about uh, um, the, uh, another way, which is called vital netosis. And we also talked about the exosol trap formation in general, how mast cells, eosinophils, even plant cells are capable of, of, of formation. We also described the role of, of these extra traps and immunity and, and various pathological conditions really high level uh, from SLE to, uh, to even to tr thrombosis. And that's how we segued into uh, COVID-19 complications and how we examined some of the existing research out there. So, of course, there are many, many people um, who I'd like to thank who, who's, whose work was included in here and in really, uh, bits and pieces and, and people whom I've worked with together over the years at Semmelweis University, uh, my, my mentor, Krasimir Kolev, at Harvard Medical School, uh, my excellent mentor, Denisa Wagner, at the National Institute of Biological Standards and Control in the UK, uh, where, I, where I was able to spend some time with an EMBO fellowship at Colony Longstaff, who provided invaluable uh, input to, into some of this research, Fulbright Scholarship, and, 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 and many, many others who, uh, who helped me do some research in this, in this uh, exciting area. So with, with that said, I would, I would like to thank you for your attention. And the last thing I have here is a little riddle. Um, we've talked about nets and what they look like and how fibrillar they are. And we also talked about fibrin a lot of times. And we know how these two work together in, in thrombus formation and in immunothrombosis. So I'd really like to take a stab at which one this could be. Is this a neutrophil exosolar trap or is this a fibrin? And you will have three two, one seconds to guess that is actually neater. It's a frozen lake. It's one of my favorite images ever. Well, thank you for your attention. And uh, I would love to continue the discussion. Here's a link to my LinkedIn and also an, an email address. Thank you so much for tuning in.